Hello and welcome to Ways to Change the World. I'm Krishnan Giri Murthy, and this is the podcast in which we talk to extraordinary people about the big ideas in their lives, the things they believe, and the events that have helped shape them. My guest this week has spent most of her life trying to change the world, and in many ways she already has. She has just written a book called The Purpose of Power, and she leads an organisation which is all about giving black Americans political power. But one of the things she's perhaps best known for is for being one of the people who started and founded the whole Black Lives Matter movement. Alicia Garza, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. There's so much to talk about (laughs) with you in your life (laughs) because you've been involved with so many different causes and ways to change the world, but you seem to now have a very clear focus around how to do things and how to deliver the kinds of political change that you seek. Is that why you've written the book? Well, I think I wrote the book because I wanted to share some things that I'm learning, some things that I'm unlearning, and some things that I've learned about what it means to create change. And I'm hoping that this book can be a tool for others who have either been activists for a long time, or are people who are just starting out, they're just trying to find a political community. You know, for me, I have over the years gotten a little bit clearer about some things, more confused about other things. But certainly, I I have been narrowing my focus over the years to black political power being my kind of central Uh, my central focus, and really trying to organize the things that I do around the pursuit of that. Um, And I think it's an example of what I think is part of movement building, which I always say is finding your lane, getting in it and doing it very, very well. We are recording this three weeks before the US presidential election. Um, After a summer in which we have seen the deaths of Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, the shooting of Jacob Blake, and many others. And the reactions to those shootings have been truly remarkable. And I presume after you wrote this book. So are you feeling any differently right now? Or has has what's happened this summer just been part of a long continuum? Well, I'm feeling hopeful, frankly. I don't know what's going to happen in the upcoming election cycle, but what I do know is that um, it will be um, an election where the most amount of people participate, and that's huge for a country like the United States. Um, I also know that what is galvanizing people to the polls uh, this November is racism. Um, Racism is 100% on the ballot, as my sister Erin Haynes is known to say from uh, the 19th. Uh, You know, people are fed up with what is happening in this country. I think the events of this summer uh, really helped to clarify for people how dangerous this administration is and how dangerous they'll be um, if they're if they're allowed to continue to hold power. Now, you have have stopped being directly involved with Black Lives Matter um, a couple of years ago, and you have this organization called the Black Futures Lab, which we will talk about. But how has it been for you seeing Black Lives Matter reach this crescendo? It's incredible. I feel really honored to be the smallest part of this global um, rebellion. And, you know, for myself and Patrice and Opal, Patrice is now kind of leading the global network. Uh, You know, for so many years, the three of us were working multiple jobs. I still have multiple jobs that I'm I'm doing. And so it's wonderful to see something that you created um, really get get legs and gain steam. Um, And what I know is that it also motivates me. I, I think that what we've learned over the last seven years is that there is not nearly enough infrastructure uh, that can make black communities powerful, not just in politics, but in every aspect of our lives. And so I really have spent the last five years or so um, helping to build that infrastructure for and by black communities. Where Where do you think it's going, though? I mean, you say that a lot of people are going to vote in this election. How can you be sure? Well, 
A lot of people will vote. I didn't say who people will vote for, but what I do know is that uh, people are turning out in record numbers. And and the way that I know that is from uh, exit polling from early voting. Um, I also know it because we're talking to black voters in particular all across the nation, but focused in nine states. And we've been doing uh, voter education work, voter cultivation work, and voter mobilization work for the last year now. So we're in touch with black voters um, every day, all day. And we've been spending the last uh, couple of weeks actually motivating people to the polls, um, being a repository for clear and direct and factual information, and then also connecting folks across geographies. I think in this moment where there's an incredible Re uh, reckoning around racism and racial terror and racial violence, uh, it's important for folks to be connected to one another, to know that they're a part of the community that is fighting back. Let, let's go back to childhood, because that's where changing the world began for you, I guess. Um, why did you come out as a child who wanted to make the world a better place? What was it that was driving you? I think it was really um, my mom. You know, I, I grew up for a few years in the first part of my life with a single mother. And she was someone who got pregnant with me and didn't expect to be single when she had me. Um, unfortunately, at that time, her relationship fell apart, but she continued on the journey towards parenthood. And she and her twin brother, my uncle, um, went about the task of uh, trying to raise a, a, a black girl in a world that hates black people. <laughs> and so, you know, my mom worked many, many jobs. My uncle also worked a couple of jobs and they alternated. My uncle worked in the evening. My mom worked during the day. And I saw so much of how she struggled to make ends meet. And she always did it with a smile on her face, but I know it wasn't easy for her. And, you know, for me, um, I know that there are many, many black women across this nation, across this world, who um, are sitting up late at night trying to figure out how to pursue their dreams and also trying to figure out how to make it to the next day. And that certainly motivates me to want to make change. I don't know that I knew that at 12 years old, but I can say that, you know, over time, that's what's kept me um, involved and engaged. You know, also, I'll, I'll just offer here that um, one of the things that motivates me the most is making sure that people have the tools and the resources they need to make the decisions that shape their lives. And so many of us actually um, are having decisions be made about us without us every single day. And that results in sometimes disastrous um, effects. It results in rigged rules, right, that leave our communities out and leave our communities behind. And that's certainly true when it relates to black communities. And so I think from a very young age, I've understood that um, in order to be powerful in your life, you have to be a part of the rulemaking process, but you also have to have the information the accurate information that you need to be able to make well-informed choices on your behalf and on behalf of your family and community. And so I would say from 12 years old all the way up until now, that is the work that I've been doing. Right. But when did you first realize or when did you have the first conversation with your mother where she explained the way the world was? Um, when, you know, when did you realize that you didn't have the power that you were entitled to or that America was a racist country? Um, well, I mean, I've had these experiences my whole life. I, I don't know if my mom ever sat me down and said, this is the way the world is. You never had the talk. Uh, I mean, we've all had the talk, but that's not the talk that I think inspired me to want to do the work that I do. I will say that, you know, for me, um, growing up for the first part of my life with a single mother, uh, you know, she talked to me a lot about sex and she would say things like sex makes babies and babies are expensive. And that meant in my household, you know, we didn't mince any words about, um, you know, pregnancy, about how to prevent pregnancy, about relationships, intimacy, desire. Um, and that was really profound, I think, for a black woman to share those experiences with her daughter, um, given her experiences, um, having 
you know, a relationship that fell apart and um, having to navigate, how, having to raise a, a child on her own. Um, those are the kinds of talks that my mom would have with me. But I think for myself, when we talk about racial reckonings, there are so many that happen in our lives that um, <laughs> I think that we don't totally see as what we might name it now. So, for example, I remember being in a fifth grade class and uh, my teacher taking my hands and turning the palms of my hands over and saying, oh, my God, are are all of your palms so light as compared to the rest of your skin? I mean, these are the kinds of of of. Uh, experiences that every single black person in the world has had. Um, but I think when it comes to deciding what you're going to do about it, uh, there's a whole a whole process here that I think people go through. And I talk a lot about my process in the book. Um, and one of the things that I talk about there is uh, my involvement in a campaign around reproductive justice, making sure that uh, students in my school were able to access contraception in school nurses' offices. And, you know, at that time, there was a, a huge hoopla around uh, teen pregnancy as some kind of epidemic. And yet, political environment around us, um, you know, was certainly doing two things that were incredibly faulty. Um, one thing was talking about us, but not talking to us. And so everybody's having conversations around young people. Uh, but young people, the fact of the matter is, we're having sex, we're getting bad information and didn't have the resources or tools that we needed to be safe if we were making those choices. The other thing, of course, that was happening at that time was frankly, that, um, you know, this notion of abstinence only education as a way to curb teen pregnancy when people were already having sex. And so if what you're doing is not educating people on how to be safe, then essentially what you're what you're doing is accelerating the problem that you're trying to um, to avoid. And so that was my first campaign. And it was a way for me to understand how to make change. And so did you have sort of formed politics as a young person? Did you have a series of things that you wanted to achieve? Um, I think my politics, like everybody else's, grows over time. Uh, at first, I thought that what I wanted to do was help people and I wanted to advocate on others' behalf. But as I kind of continued in this work, what I learned is that actually the way that power is built is when every gay people get to be the heroes in their own stories when they're not waiting for a superman or another superhero to swoop in and take care of everything um and so for me the process of helping people see their own value and their own um role in making change is something that i've been committed to for a very long time. And it's something I talk about in the book, the difference between activism and organizing, and the difference between speaking on behalf of someone and building people's capacity to speak for themselves and to design the kinds of plans based on information about how things work that can disrupt the way that things work. And what is the difference between activism and organizing? Well, the difference between activism and organizing is this. I mean, activism often involves uh, an individual taking action. And sometimes it happens that that individual takes action on their own behalf. Um, but organizing involves the process of bringing people together to engage in collective action. Uh, so, you know, you can be somebody who cares a lot about animal rights and you can decide that you are no longer going to eat animal products. And and be very vocal about that. That's somebody who's an activist. Uh, somebody who is an organizer brings people together to figure out how to change the rules that give animals more rights. Um, and so I think it's important to create these distinctions, uh, not for the purposes of, of talking about one being better than the other, but for the purpose of talking about how change happens and how power is actually built. So let, let's skip right forward to where you are now with the Black Futures Lab. What, what's the purpose of the organization? The work that we do at the lab is to make black communities powerful in politics so that we can be powerful in the rest of our lives. And again, we're addressing the challenge that a lot of black communities face, which is that 
we are being spoken about, but we are not being spoken to. And that lack of engagement uh, and that lack of involvement is really eroding our democracy. It's eroding our ability to change the conditions in our communities, but it's also eroding the trust and the uh, uh, level of um, confidence that people have in a government for all the people. And so for what we do at the lab, we've done a number of things that help put black communities at the center of political processes, whether that be the Black Census Project, which is the largest survey of black people in America in 155 years, uh, to the Black Agenda, which is a legislative roadmap from that talks about how to make uh, Black Lives Matter in policy from City Hall to Congress, uh, to using that Black agenda and getting more than 70,000 Black people to sign on to this agenda and commit to using this agenda uh, as they are making decisions about how they're voting in November. Um, all the way up to uh, uh, training our communities how to change the rules that have been rigged against us for a long time. We launched a project uh, this year called the Black to the Future Public Policy Institute. And that is where we are training 40 uh, black fellows from nine states across the nation how to rewrite the rules that have been rigged against us and how to win those rules in our state legislatures and in our city halls. And, you know, black communities are not just to be studied, we're to be engaged with. And what we are doing is building relationships. We are building on existing networks and we're building new relationships and we are making sure that we are taking collective action together and having that action be informed by the experiences of black people across demographics. So, so to what extent are you leading that policy conversation with your own ideas uh, and to what extent are you trying to gather you know from ground up what people think and trying to translate that into a policy program. Because people often don't know what the policy should be. You know, they know how they feel about something. They know what they want, want to improve or want tackled, but aren't always necessarily, you know, great at sort of translating that into a, and this is the policy that needs to come out of it. So how, how are you going through that? Well, actually, I would disagree with you. I think that what we um, what we have found from talking to more than 30,000 black people across this nation is that people are very clear about the policy changes that they want to see. And all that policy is, is talking about how things are supposed to be done. Certainly policy uses certain structures and certain languages, but at the core of it, right, the, what policy is, is talking about how things must be for everyone. And so um, our communities uh, certainly do have the uh, very clear policy ideas uh, and policy solutions that uh, we try to get implemented in cities and states across the nation. Our policy agenda was informed by our Black Census Project. And what we also did with this agenda is we talked to some of the leading uh, organizers and activists in these various issue areas and asked them to do big picture thinking. Um, if you could, uh, uh, you know, if, if all things were aligned, right, what would the best most Cadillac policy be? <laughs> be? We matched what was politically possible with what was politically visionary. And I think we found those responses, uh, both of those types of responses in the black census. And that's what makes our black agenda so unique. Number one issue. The number one issue facing black people in America, according to our survey, is wages that are too low to support a family, quickly followed by the lack of access to affordable and quality health care, And then of course, quickly followed by the lack of access to affordable and quality housing. And, and, and people generally rank them in that order, do they? They did. And, and so when it comes to sort of what you should do about that, um, how, how easy is it to crystallize that? Sure. So the majority of our survey respondents said that what they thought in relationship to low wages that were not enough to support a family is that there should be a universal uh, living wage. They wanted to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour, but most people in our survey also talked about 
wanting to have a, a living wage that would be uh, consistent across the board. Because, of course, in the United States, in some states, the minimum wage is $15 an hour. In other states, it's still $5 an hour. And in the states where it's still $5 an hour, it happens to be uh, states that have the highest populations of black people. Uh, folks talked a lot about wanting to make sure that unions were protected, uh, making sure that every workplace has the right to collectively bargain. Uh, people talked a lot about eliminating uh, racism and disparities in terms of hiring and in the workplace and strengthening protections that have been rolled back from the federal government and in some cases uh, in state governments uh, around protecting civil rights in the workplace. And there's a whole range of other solutions that people offered here. And folks can find that on our website at www.blacktothefuture.org. You can also find it at blackcensus.org. Is this inevitably a liberal or left-wing agenda, or is there a way of making it more bipartisan? Well, what I thought was really fascinating about our survey is that we talked to people across the political spectrum. We talked to people from every single demographic, including political ideology. And so this is not a left wing or liberal agenda. And in fact, if I was to write it myself, it would probably be more radical. What I love about this agenda is that, in fact, it does represent the most common denominator amongst the range of black folks who live in this country. And I think that that's an important starting place for political power. It's an important starting place for a political agenda to not just um, hang on either side of the aisle, but to really kind of meet where most people agree. Um, and of course, you know, we have used this agenda to advocate for better legislation um, from City Hall to Congress. We have also uh, advocated for this agenda to be adopted by political parties. And so I think it's important for us um, that we look at, the way that we look at our work is um, that we understand that Black communities are not a monolith and we need political programs and political organizations that know that as well. And how successful have you been at getting the Democratic Party to take them up? Somewhat successful. We had some of our uh, Black Agenda items integrated into the party platform this year, uh, which is huge. Uh, we have also had um, lots of legislative level in terms of moving uh, some of our uh, policy recommendations. Uh, so there's also the challenge, though, that uh, both parties, frankly, um, have a problem around race and uh, certainly um, have a, a long way to go to figuring out how to undo uh, the rigged rules that allow racism to persist, even within the political parties themselves. And, and do you feel that they are, I mean, the, particularly the Democratic Party, are still kind of um, scared of saying what's right um, or, or even talking to the right people? I mean, I, I've just come back from a month in America and I was in Wisconsin when both Joe Biden and Kamala Harris arrived in Milwaukee and went to Kenosha, um, in Biden's case. Um, and I was really struck by sort of who they were meeting and who they weren't meeting. You know, um, Kamala Harris came into town and met a group of business people and didn't really go to any of the black areas and talk to ordinary black people. And you kind of thought, well, if you're making a big deal of having a black candidate, why isn't she going talking to black people? <laughs> well, I'll say this. Um, number one, you know, Senator Harris is born and raised in Oakland, where I live. Um, and as somebody who's born and raised here and has lived here all my life, I can say that political campaigns are complicated. I can also say that um, Democrats nor Republicans meet the mark when it comes to black communities. And both parties, frankly, um, take advantage of our community's support. They take advantage of our community's conditions. And so, and I think black communities relate to both political parties in that same way. I will also say that, um, for me, what I think is most important here is um, how black communities show up and show out. Um, we can't depend on um, we can't depend on allegiance to um, personalities 
right? We have to depend on allegiance to policy. And what I know is that Senator Harris actually has one of the most progressive records um, in the Senate, um, even though I have deep criticisms, right, of some of her record on criminal justice reform uh, as it relates to some of the work that she did here in California. Um, I think it's, an, it's um, I think black communities clearly understand um, who is working in our interests and who is not. Um, and I think and what I know is that given the uh, <laughs> given the vigilante violence that we've been watching all through the country this year, uh, given the ways in which black communities are holding on by a thread economically, um, I don't think that it's unclear right, um, where those allegiances lie. I also think that what we have to look at here is that um, governance does need to change and democracy needs to change. And it's something that we've been working on for a very, very long time. And for, for myself, the Black Futures Lab and the Black to the Future Action Fund really represents the best of that. Um, what we are doing is changing the way that decisions are being made. And yes, political campaigns um, are often uh, inundated with the need to raise money um, and that often gets in the way of legislating uh, and that is not limited to Senator Harris or Biden I think uh, when we look at what ha is happening with our president right now I mean he is literally making money off of being the president um, so you know there's a wide spectrum of, of, of things that we have to consider here but ultimately what we do is we work to build the capacity of black communities to be powerful in these processes and to not have to wait for somebody else um, to save us, to know that we can use the power of the ballot box to save ourselves. And, and how are you engaging those people who don't really want to engage or, or are you not trying to persuade them? I mean, you know, do you, do you basically end up engaging with people who are receptive or, or if somebody basically says, I'm not really interested do you try and persuade them to be interested? It's not about persuasion. This is about connecting to people's experiences and connecting to what people want to do to change it. Um, we're not in the business of trying to persuade anybody to do anything. Uh, most of the people that we talk to um, are, are experiencing extreme um, disappointment, experiencing extreme disparities, and they are looking for something um, to help change that. And so that is where we come in. But we are not, we're not selling anything. We're not a charity. We are an organization that takes the best of our radical imagination and tries to translate that into how our society is organized. But, but I mean, you must, I mean, if you're going sort of knocking on doors and talking to people, you know, you must find very differing responses to what you're saying. You know, and some people, of course. you know, and, and some people sort of, are so, I mean, what I re, what really struck me that on this trip that I've just done is is how disengaged so many people seem to be, and how distrusting of the system, of politics, of the media, of of everything, so many people seem to be, um, and very uh, very skeptical that anything could change. I think that that is true in relationship to elections, but I don't think that that is true in relationship to how people are engaged in their lives. And, you know, as somebody who has knocked thousands and thousands of doors in many different communities, I can tell you that people have every right to believe that, um, that their government doesn't work for them because right now it doesn't. Um, but if you are a part of an effort and you can become a part of an effort that can make government work for you, things do change. And I have encountered families and people who have been deeply cynical about the process of change. But I also think it's important to understand that that cynicism is disappointment and it's hurt and it is anxiety and it's grief from the things that we've lost. But our job here, if we want to change anything, um, is not to um, uh, uh, leave people where they are. Our job is to help people find uh, the possibility in their participation. And so that's a lot of the work that we do. Well, that, well that, that's why I'm asking you, what, what about the ones who, who, are, who don't really want to engage with you? You know, what is, what is the right thing to do? Is it to say, OK, I respect that and move on? to the next house and see if they're more interested 
or is it to try and say, you know, to try and stay longer and try and find out more about their lives and try and find out what's the go- what's going to be the thing that draws them in? It depends on the person. And I think as an organizer, what you get to know very well is what's underneath that no. And so I have had people say no to me five, six, seven, eight, nine times, and you still stay engaged with them. You're not trying to persuade people to do anything, but organizing is about building relationships. And so, you know, if you find a spot that's very delicate or sensitive for somebody or uh, a spot that is uh, tense with someone, um, certainly uh, you want to make sure that you stay in relationship. You don't want to just pull back and say, okay, okay, it's great, okay, sorry. Um, you want to get more information about why. And I think in my 20 years of doing this work, one of the things that I have realized is that staying in connection and staying in relationship um, can inspire hope inside of people who said they didn't have any. And, you know, as many doors have been slammed in my face, many, many more have been opened. And I think that does actually reflect the spirit of people in this country who have been left out and left behind. Um, Most days, black people are being ignored and we're being talked about, but we're not being talked to. And you've clearly decided to negotiate the system, to organize people, to use the system and to use the law and the rules and political structures to try and deliver the change you seek. What is the relationship between that and protest and direct action? I wouldn't characterize my work that way. How I would characterize my work is using all of the tools available to us to make change. That's also what I talk about in the book. I actually say that you need all of it. You need disruption, you need protest, and you also need to change policies. And too often in our movements, we focus on and media focuses on the protests and the disruption, and then we'll turn around and say, but what has actually changed? (laughs) And so, you know, one of the things that I talk a lot about in the book is the need to marry the, 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 the cultural and social disruption with the disruption in the rules that are organizing our lives. And if those things aren't brought together, um, we will not achieve the change that we seek. So, so, so you have to do it all? Correct. Do you think, do you think the same people do, the, do all of those things? Or can you have different groups of people who end up working together? So Black Lives Matter as a movement right now um, seems primarily about people showing their feelings on the street. Um, is that fine to be a discreet thing or do they all need to do what you're doing? That's not at all what Black Lives Matter is about. Black Lives Matter has been protesting and changing policy for the last seven years. And in fact, in 2015, um, what we saw was 40 new laws on criminal justice reform passed in 26 states just in one year. And that had to do with the advocacy of Black Lives Matter organizers and activists that you also see in the streets. I think there's an issue here where so many of us don't actually understand how change happens. And we get fed sensationalized stories about change, who makes it, um, how it happens, and you know what side of the spectrum do you stand on in relationship to change. We've been sold those narratives the nonviolent versus violent narrative. We've been sold the voting versus protest narrative. And those narratives were not actually designed by us. They're not designed by our movements. They're designed by spectators who have never participated in movements. And this is why this book is so important is because you get the vantage point of how movements are being built from somebody who's been helping to build them for the last 20 years. I will say that, you know, in my, from my perspective, um, we have many, many roles that need to be filled and not everybody needs to play every role, but you do have to find a lane and get in it and do what you're good at and do it really, really well. And then join with other people who are doing the same thing, not the same thing that you're doing, but who are also finding their lane and getting in it and performing their role very, very well. Um, I have friends in this work that you know, their contribution is art. And so they are, you know, very, very talented in um, 
uh, touching hearts and changing culture. That's a part of movements. I also have friends who um, are policymakers and and lawmakers, and they um, have they share the same vision for Black Lives Matter, and so they're taking that into their work. And um, that's really what movements are. And I and I talk a lot about that in my book. Let's talk about how Black Lives Matter began and what what it became. Um, where did the phrase come from? So I do discuss this in my book. We talk about uh, the fact that Black Lives Matter as a hashtag was started by me. Uh, and it came after the acquittal of George Zimmerman in the murder of Trayvon Martin. Uh, it became a series of social media platforms that connect people online in order to take action together offline. And today, Black Lives Matter has dozens of chapters in more than four countries around the world. It is a global movement. There is also the Movement for Black Lives, which is a coalition of more than 150 Black-led organizations working together to make Black Lives Matter across the nation and globally. Uh, and it is certainly a global movement. But that, that first hashtag, you wrote Black Lives Matter. I did. So what was the what was the sort of the process, if you like, of how that became a ha you know a hashtag that spread? Well, I think social media allows things to become viral, and we didn't have a strategy to make it viral. Um, it's something that people saw and related to. It got spread through our networks, uh, and it got spread in a moment where people were angry and grieving and rageful. Do you remember what you wanted at that stage? Sure. I mean, what I wanted was two things. Number one, I really wanted to have us tell a different story about what we deserve. Um, so much of what I was seeing at that time was um, felt defeated. Um, and what I wanted and what I still want and what I work for every single day is to make sure that our communities don't feel defeated before we've even fought. And the other thing that I wanted was um, for us to believe, right, that black people are um, deserving of better, that we deserve to be alive. And that actually it doesn't matter how you look, it doesn't matter how much education you have, that actually your life is sacred and it is your birthright. And, and are you hopeful right now? I am actually very hopeful when I think about how it is that I got here, when I think about the things that I've seen over my lifetime. Um, what I know is that um, the people who have come before me have endured much, much more. And we have a lot of the tools available to us that we need right now to make the change that we need to have happen. And so um, whatever happens in November, um, we're gonna be okay. And things are gonna be hard, uh, but we're gonna be okay. And what I know is important in this moment is making sure that our communities have the things that we need to live well, um, to be engaged and to be making decisions on our own behalf. And so that's the work we're gonna keep doing. And I am feeling hopeful about the spirit and the innovation and the imagination of black communities. And, and do you think you will go into electoral politics yourself? Is that the logical next step? No, I don't think so. I'm not thinking about that. Why is that? I'm, I have a zillion jobs right now. <laughs> I've just written a book. I'm running an organization building black political power in black communities. Uh, I organize on behalf of domestic workers. Uh, I've been organizing women around the election cycle. I have a lot on my plate right now. And, and do you think, I'm sort of trying to try and work out sort of, you know, in the, sort of the, the scale of importance of sort of how you deliver that change. You know, do you think electoral politics is less important now than perhaps we used to think of it? No, not at all. I think that electoral politics is incredibly important, but not for the sake of itself. I mean, electoral politics to me is an opportunity to demonstrate um, how successful you are in winning hearts and minds. And it's an opportunity also to demonstrate what are the majoritarian values of a place. And so that is one piece, as I've said, of change. It is not all the pieces and it is not the only piece, but it does allow us to see more clearly 
um, how values are or are not shifting in a place at any given time and how that might translate into rulemaking. If you could change the world in any way, wave a magic wand, write a new chapter to a book that comes true, what would you do? I would change how people understand race. Too often we think about race as something that is uh, too bad. We think about race as something that is a shame as opposed to something that is preventable, uh, as opposed to something that is deliberate, um, and as opposed to something that impacts everybody's lives, not just the lives of black people. And so if I could change one thing, I would uh, change the way that people understand the way that race and racism functions in order for us to then be able to have real conversations and take real action around how to dismantle it. Alicia Garza, thank you very much indeed for your time. Thanks for Thank sharing you. your ways to change the world and good luck. Thank you so much. You can watch all of these interviews on the Channel 4 News YouTube channel. I hope you'll give us a rating and a review if you enjoyed them. Our producer is Belena Dambelli. Until next time, bye-bye.